it's terrifying when you're skidding into a curve to steer into the curve or into the skid to steer out. But the only way we can take control is to lean in to what we see as our disadvantage and then you'll realize it's actually a superpower. Hey everybody, thank you for joining me today. I've got another amazing success story to share that I know will inspire and activate the greatness in you. Matthew Pollard is joining me on the show. Matthew, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, well, um, first heard you on Jason Waller's show, and I've heard you on several others. And um, the reason I wanted to bring you on was not just um, you know the message that you have, but the you, the way you tell your story and the way you sort of I don't know, just your back and forth with people was very sort of calming and reassuring. And that's I love to bring great stuff to my audience, but also like calming and reassuring people you know, rather than people who are banging me over the head with whatever they do, and you are certainly not, uh, or I have not seen you be that person. So uh, if that's who you really are, then bring it. But uh, but anyway, let me, um, let me tell you all a little bit about Matthew. So Matthew Pollard is an internationally recognized consultant, speaker, blogger, author, introvert, mentor, coach, and serial entrepreneur with five multi-million dollar business successes under his belt, all before the age of 30. It's very impressive, and I, I do want to dig into that. He is the founder and CEO of Rapid Growth, LLC, dedicated to achieving maximum ROI for businesses of all sizes. And while he works with Fortune 500 companies and some of the biggest ones out there, his real passion is helping small business owners end the overwhelm, eliminate the stress and guesswork, and get on a clear path to rapid growth. Forbes calls Matthew, the real deal, and his methods have transformed over 3,500 businesses to date. Matthew's newest book, The, Intro the Introvert's Edge to Networking, is the second in uh, what I'm calling a series. I, I hope you call it a series he's creating that started with his first book, The Introvert's Edge, How the Quiet and Shy Can Outsell Anyone. And that's what really got my attention because the first time I heard Matthew talk, I resonated with that. I am an introvert. I had to learn how to sell in my first business and it was not comfortable. And it's not comfortable for me today to sell myself, sell my products, sell anything. But uh, like he has, and he'll describe to you all, you know, I've, I've figured out a way to deal with it because you have to. If you want to be successful in life, you have to figure out a way to deal with stuff. So Matt, Matthew, uh, let's just get started. Uh, how did it happen for you? So look, I think that's a really important question. And, you know, I, I know you say you always lead your interviews with that, but I think it implies even more specifically when you're talking to somebody that really talks on the topic of introversion, because like you said, you heard me on a bunch of podcasts before this and naturally anybody that's good at being a guest on podcasts, anyone that's good at speaking from stage, anyone that's good at sales, anyone that's successful period, we tend to project extroversion upon them, don't we? And yes. the problem is, I mean, we see people as they are today and we don't think, oh, maybe they've learned strategies or skills. And you know, I, I, if, if anything, I hope my story really helps the average introvert realize they're not second class citizens, their path to success is just different to that of an extrovert. And it's not by learning how to become more extroverted, that's definitely, that's a path to anxiety and stress. It's about learning the skills that you need to become amazing at you know who you're meant to be and who you are meant to be could be also including an amazing salesperson amazing networker amazing public speaker but again leveraging your natural skills and i mean i found out all this the hard way i mean I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. I was super introverted. I had really bad acne. And, you know, at the end of, you know, about year, well, just before year 11 started, I got diagnosed with this thing called Erlen syndrome, which for the video watchers here, I can show you, you know, I put on this funny pair of colored lenses and miraculously I can learn to read. Now I can't learn to read like everyone else. I could start the process of learning to read. The problem was that, you know, I mean, that just meant two years of hustle. And by the time I graduated, I got to the top 20% of my state, but I mean, I was exhausted. I mean, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. And, you know, I felt like I was the slow kid my whole life. I, you know, I had been working so hard. My family and I just all agreed that I was gonna spend a, a year really finding myself before I, I went to college. Otherwise they just knew that I wouldn't, I, I would have spun out, I know I would have. So I took a job at a real estate agency and before people think it, I'm gonna tell you, I wasn't the guy out selling, I was the guy in the back office with a, a look on my face, don't, don't speak to me, I'm here to find myself. 
But literally three weeks into that job, I mean, I, I was told, um, unfortunately, they're closing down the office. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been there three weeks. This was supposed to be my year safe job while I figured things out. And this was Australia at Christmas time. I mean, you can't get a job in Australia at Christmas time. I mean, we go on holidays on the 20th of December. We go on summer break and Christmas break. We don't come back till the 15th or 20th of January. And the only jobs I could find were these things called commission only sales. And I think Mike, you kind of introduced it at the start, right? As an introvert, the last thing you want to be thinking about is having to sell. Well, that was my only opportunity. But the only thing that was more scary than applying for these commission only sales roles was telling my father, who broke his back 80 hours a week to support the family that you know there was just no way for me um, to get work so i applied for all three commission only jobs in the paper and i got three interviews then i got three jobs and i kind of thought maybe they saw something in me that i didn't see myself but my manager for the b2b telecommunication sales role i took uh, quickly put that to bed they were like mate we just hire everyone we throw mud up against the wall and we just see what sticks i was the mud well long mm. story short you know, I got thrown out on a road called Sydney Road in Melbourne, Australia, after five days product training, not a single second of sales training, and just got told to go and sell. So I took a deep breath, went to walk in my first door after realizing I didn't know what to say. Luckily enough, I, I got politely told to leave when I walked in, then I was less politely told to leave, then I was sworn at, then I was told to get a real job. And just door after door that happened until my 93rd door where I made my first sale. And I remember I, I made about $70. Well. I remember that I just looked down the barrel of a year of this, like a year of doing exactly this job. And it, you know, it just wasn't okay. And I think a lot of people that are, that are listening really do one of two things. They'll either quit or they'll just decide that's the way it is and they're gonna grind it out. Well, I decided sales had to be a system because if it wasn't, my year was gonna be terrible. And I, I went to work looking for that system. I mean, with my reading issues, picking up a book wasn't really an opportunity. So I picked up a, I managed to find YouTube and I typed in sales system and all these videos came up. And then day after day, I just focused on perfecting the system. You know, I'd go out in the field and put to work what I'd learned the day before, focus on the next step. And then I'd go home and practice for eight hours. Weekends, I'd spend 16 hours a day practicing. But day after day, I'd get better. I mean, and that's really how it happened. I went from 93 doors to 78 to 36 to 21 to 18 to nine. Eventually I got it down to making a sale on average every three doors. And about six weeks in, my manager pulls me aside. I thought I was in trouble because I was the guy that handed my paperwork in downstairs and really tried not to talk to any of the boisterous sales reps upstairs, talking about how they closed that deal or how tough the market was getting. My manager looked at me and he said, Matt, we're kind of blown away by this, but we just got our national sales figures and it turns out you're the number one salesperson in the company, which just so happened to be the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. So, I mean, that was really my, my beginning. And, you know, after a really big fail in management my first time, back to YouTube, learn to manage. And then a year later, I started my own business. And, you know, fast forward just shy of a decade, we heard that you told the story. You know, I'd been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. Hmm. There's a ton in there. Let's break, let's break some of that down if you don't mind. So, um, and congratulations, by the way. So let's start with the vision part. Um, so you, you had been, as I understood it, you've been sort of diagnosed, maybe incorrectly, as having dyslexia or some type of, um, you know, reading disability. And 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 turns out that you had something with your vision. And you mentioned what it was. And I think it's less important that people understand what it, the name of it, than what it actually was and what the glasses did to help you. Yeah, absolutely. So, and it's actually quite commonly misdiagnosed as dyslexia. So okay. if you like, I was diagnosed as a dyslexic who just wasn't trying hard enough, wasn't trying to apply the strategies, which happens a lot. Um, the thing that I got um, diagnosed with was Erlen syndrome, which is the easy way of pronouncing it because it's actually pronounced scotomic sensitivity syndrome, which I don't know why that when there's somebody that can't read or spell, they make the words so hard, yeah, but not? that is literally what it's <laughs> called. And basically what it means is I put on, so if you can imagine the, the white page, the white page has a spectrum of colors in it. And if you have Erlen syndrome or scotomic sensitivity syndrome, it means you have a sensitivity to one of those colors. So basically, I wear a pair of blue lenses, which filters out the color yellow. And once you filter out the color yellow, all of a sudden, I can learn to decode words just like everybody else. And that's the key, because for me, basically what happens is the white page actually eats the letters. And so when you're a child, you learn to decode letters and then words and then sometimes whole sentences. For someone like me, the letters look different every time because the, depending on the ink, the, the white ate the letters in different ways. Oh, For other nice. people, it causes the words to move on the page. It causes them to you know, jumble up. It's, it's a horrible condition for those that have it. 
And all it really takes is putting a little bit of perspex color on front. Like if you, if you don't wanna to go to the effort of doing this, if you've got a child that struggles with reading, get a whole bunch of different color perspex and put the perspex over the, the white paper with the printed text and just see if it looks better for your child or worse. And some made it much, much worse, like the color pink. You know, other colors like blue made it much, much better. And, you know, over time, you know, I, I started to realize it was a certain type or shade of blue, which, you know, I, I now have put onto a pair of colored lenses. I've got it on contacts as well, though I can't stand them. Um, they do work also. Okay, so this is something that is you're going to have for your lifetime, then you just need to use the glasses when you need to read something. Absolutely. And I can tell you, oh. it's, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of concentration to read, but you get it gets easier. What I mean by that is when I was younger, I could barely read anything. Now, because I've used the glasses for a long period of time, I can recognize the words even without glasses a lot oh. of the time. That doesn't mean that if I was to read a chapter of a book without my glasses, I would be exhausted because it takes all my attention, all my focus to just hold the letters and really concentrate. So reading is not a relaxing thing for me. I mean, that's why, you know, I listen to a ton of books on Audible. You know, Audible has been a huge supporter of my work because for me, that's, that's how I consumed information to get to where I am today, um, which is why when my books came out, I wanted them to be out on Audible at the exact same time. And, you know, the audio book outsells the print book three to one. And how was the creation of the audio book for you? Because you have <laughs> well, to read to do the it was audio much, book, right? It was much easier. So while okay. everybody, I constantly get c congratulated on how great a job I do, it's just because it's another Australian reading it and everyone thinks we gotcha. sound the same. Okay. Um, but I will tell you, there's um, a great guy, uh, Jamie, who, who recorded them. He actually is an actor um, out of New York City. Uh, he's from Brisbane. So to me, he sounds totally different. Okay. But to yeah. the average American, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of people struggle to tell the difference between the Australian accent and the English accent, the South African South one and New Zealand one the mm -hmm. different the eccentricities of the difference between melbourne and brisbane that's you know <laughs> a bridge too far so everybody says you know that you know i did a great job with the audiobook but you know luckily enough i work with a, a mainstream publisher which i mean could you ever imagine a guy with reading issues ending up getting a deal with like a, the, the likes of harper collins yeah, but Collins, they yeah. organize all of that great stuff so the only thing i mandated is that i well that i i wished for begged and pleaded for was that it published on the same time, the audiobook, the print book, and the Kindle. Um, and also that it was read by someone with an Australian accent. So at least that part of the brand was still there because, you know, while I, I hope everyone's enjoying the content today, you know, I do know my Australian accent lets people hang on just a little while longer. Oh, yeah. The, everybody in the U.S. is just enamored with, uh, with, with that accent, right? Well, any of the ones that you mentioned, actually, British, South African, New Zealand, Australian, it's a home run. <laughs> Yeah, if got that, it's home. Is it what is it? Is it the same in Australia? Say for a, you know a, a U.S. English speaker, or is it there, or or is not nothing like it? So it's interesting. So I will say that. Um, when you're speaking, when an American speaks from stage in Australia or goes out and wants to sell to you, actually, it's 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 not that great for them. It's if they've got an English accent. Absolutely. Like everyone okay. loves the English accents, the French accents, but when being sold to, and I think it's because we've grown up being sold to by Americans, like all the late night TV shows and everything, we're, we're all Americans. Yeah. However, when, when I was in school, I remember we had an American exchange student, super popular. Anytime I was out and about and there was an American out and about, they always drew people listening to them. So in a business setting, just because we are always doing business with Americans. It's not impressive. Just like an Australian accent perhaps isn't that impressive in California because we're everywhere. Um, but when, you, when you're dealing with, you know, Australian social lives, absolutely American accent is very, very popular. Sorry, the American accent is very popular, I should say. I became uh, really good friends with, um, with a fellow who was actually born in California but then uh, moved to Australia and was there, I think, for 20 years. Very, very successful. Uh, sales in sales and and in training in tra sales and training Chuck Zamora is his name and he came back here to the US and moved his business here which is kind of like what you did I think we'll we'll get into that but um yeah the guy you know called my office and I wasn't interested but he left me a couple of voicemail messages and I was like oh my god okay I've got to talk to this guy <laughs> you know cuz it just blows you away it's just like you want to hear more of it so congratulations on uh, well, congratulations on your accent. Well, that's not really anything. But anyway, yes, you're using it. So good for you. Hey, well, it's, I think it's important to recognize, though, and for the people, because 
introverts specifically, because we overanalyze everything. I don't want people to go out of this interview and go, oh, he only succeeded in America because he's got an Australian oh, accent. Of Remember, mm. all of my success stories before I turned 30, they were in Australia. I, yeah. I didn't have the advantage of accent. I still had to learn how to sell, learn how to network. Sure, it gave me some slight advantages when I moved to the US. Um, however, you know, then I was selling myself. And a lot of times, I can actually say, a lot of times I'll see extroverts that are selling their first, themselves as a coach. And while they never had an issue when they were selling a widget, now they're selling themselves and they behave very similar to a lot of introverts. Because when somebody says no, how do you not take that personally? Yeah, right? right. So, yeah. you know, I had to learn how to succeed in Australia. And there's this whole backstory. I actually got hit in the head um, with a, a glass when I was um, in my early 20s. So I also had to deal with, I had bad acne. You know, I had 26 stitches across the side of my face and, you know, lack of confidence with the, the guy with the funny colored lenses. So, you know, if there's introverts listening that are like, well, can this guy actually teach me how to sell? Can he teach me how to network? Forget about whether I can teach you, because in truth, look at people like Zig Ziglar. Most people don't know he's an introvert. Look at people like Ivan Meisner, people, founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group in the world. People would say that there's no way he's an introvert, yet they are. Look at people like Bill Murray, you know, um, Oprah Winfrey, sure. for those that don't think you can do small talk, but she seems pretty good at it, right? Introverts really can succeed. The answer is, though, we can't try and succeed on somebody else's terms with somebody else's rule book. Yeah, and, and I, I really want to explore that with you. I, I guess before I get there, there's a couple things about your, your early story that I just want to dig into a little more. First of all, on the number of calls that you made. Fascinating, right? 92 no's to get, a, get your first yes. You and then it was 78. Were those consecutive days, Matthew? Because that's the one, the, the thing I wasn't sure about, what the time frame was in, in that. No, that was over the courses of weeks. So okay. if, if it, it took me six weeks to get it down to on average, I'd close a deal every three doors. Okay. So it took, you know, it, it took weeks. And I think this is what happens. Like a lot of people will learn a single tactic in sales. <clears throat> They'll go out and use it tomorrow and go, oh, that didn't work so well. Oh, I guess I just can't sell. Now, truthfully, that's actually somebody that's gone out of their way to learn sales because the average person that's an accountant, that's a lawyer, they never pick up a book on sales. They'll just go, oh, I don't have that natural gift of gab. Like it's an excuse for us not to try. So the thing that I will tell you is for me, it was a constant focus. Now, remember, I was practicing eight hours a day outside selling eight hours a day and then working on the weekend 16 hours a day. Now, some people might say, oh, you know, I've got, you know, I've got kids. You know, I, I work long hours. I just can't focus that much time. You don't need to. Remember, I went from having no business being in sales, terrified really to sell, to being the number one salesperson, the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern, Southern Hemisphere. Now, was it worth it? Gosh, I've taken that success everywhere in my life. Absolutely is what was worth it. But would you have even need to do that much? I can tell you, you know, I do a lot of events where I deliver a presentation called Build Your Story Playbook. And I'll talk about the power of story, the science behind story, and then I'll get everybody in, in, in to tell a story to their neighbor and then swap over. And then I invite somebody up to tell a story. And I'll do a transformation right there in the instant while I'll ask a few questions and then I'll tell the story back to them in a better way than they had told us where they're like, well, I, was, I hope this was recorded. And then we'll do an exercise afterwards where they do it again after understanding the structure of a story and then they coach each other. And it's a transformative difference in the story, which in truth, you need stories. You just heard me tell one for a podcast interview. You need stories in networking, you need stories in sales, you need stories for public speaking. You need stories where you want to rally the troops in your team to get motivated towards an outcome. So just learning that one thing can transform sales in so many other parts of your life. So we just do this and the whole session is 90 minutes long and it drastically shortens sales cycles and increases closure rates. So when I say to people, yes, I learned over six weeks, I learned how to become probably the one of the best salespeople in the world in six weeks. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to work as hard as I did or do it over six weeks, do it over six months, but you wanna spend the time understanding that sales is a system, finding the system that works for you because it doesn't have to be me. As I said, there's a ton. I mean, Jeb Blunt, Mark Hunter, all of these people that are still actively teaching the community at large sales, they're all introverted, right? You don't have to learn from me. What you have to do is realize that it's a system, follow somebody's system that is introverted because in truth, you're not going to believe it's possible. And there's a lot of bulldog and hard closing ways that introverts just don't feel comfortable with. So you want to follow an introvert so you feel comfortable and then do the work because without the work, it's all pointless. Like listening to this podcast interview, I'd like to think it's going to change your life. But if you don't take action on the things that I've talked about today, then you may as well just go and spend some time with your family, right? And that's the same with sales. You can read books, 
most people go out and if they're going to read a book, they'll read 10 because then they don't do the implementation part, right? They overanalyze and they never take action. Pick up a book, find one sales system, find one person you identify with to learn to sell, to learn to network, to learn to public speak, to learn to do small talk, to learn how to better parent your kids as an introvert, and then learn those skills and apply those skills to your real life. You know, as you were talking about that, and by the way, that all makes perfect sense, but as you were talking about it, I was thinking to myself, um, you had you had a couple things that I think other people lack, and I'm wondering how you get them to um, to work to work on them. The first one, the first one was, and let's just take introversion out of it for a second, if you don't mind. Um, you you know, you had um, these 92 doors that said no, and you got one yes. And over this six week period, you did two things. I think I heard you say one was deliberate practice. Like I am going to continue to um, you know, make, make the calls, but it wasn't just that it was the debriefing, what I call debriefing, right? So you would come back from a day and you would go, okay, what, you know, what do I think work? What didn't work? What? And then you said, I go to YouTube, right? And I could, I find things to help me understand maybe better what worked and what didn't work, but, but also to refine and give me tools that I can then try to work. So I think, and you've dealt with, you know, 3,500 businesses and tons of salespeople. And I wonder what your reaction is to this because I've had lots of salespeople in my um, companies and I don't think any of them do either one of those things very well. They may have a talent and a for selling and they may have great product knowledge, but the deliberate practice on where, why or why or why not they're making a sale and then the debriefing and searching out of, of knowledge to help them actually get better. I don't find, at least in my experience, I haven't found that that's something that people just go to. And I'm wondering what your experience is like and how, if you, if it's the same, how you, how you help people get past the fact that you are just not going to, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, is going to get you the same results sort of thing like the Einstein Oh, you're 100 percent right. So there are a couple of there are a couple of things you kind of pointed out there. So firstly, you know, I'll give you an example. So people are, oh, I just need to know more about the product. Usually, people know already way too much about the product, right? right? Because I mean, they're either this is what they do for a living if it's their own business, which means it's not about learning more about the product or service that you provide. It's about learning how to simplify it for the person that's listening. That's going to be overwhelmed if you open up this fire hose of jargon. And the best way a lot of times to do that is by storytelling. However, you're right, it's the, the reflection thing and most salespeople never do that. And the reason, and it's actually part of our culture, we all live in this hustle mentality kind of focus now, right? We just hustle through, we'll grind it out, we'll grind it out, we're proud grinders. Okay. That's not what we should be proud of, not without a great system. If you don't have a great system, if you don't have a plan, right? You know, there's, there's, for me, I've got this blog post that I, I, I wrote a while back called, do you have a small business or a gambling addiction? And if you're just doing the same thing and grinding it out, well, that's the same as a gambling addiction. You're just hoping for lady luck and the house always wins. So you have to focus on a process, have a plan and work that plan. Now, what I will tell you is that what I did in the first week was really just getting a semblance of a system together because you know I just said whatever comes out of my mouth, which you know statistics say the top 10% of all sales performers have a planned presentation. The bottom 80% just say whatever comes out of their mouth, which of course extroverts raised, rise to the top of that. So for me, yes, I started with, okay, I need to get an assemblance of a system together. And what I realized very quickly was there were some things I was saying on those 90, you know, two doors before I got of, of rejection, that just didn't fit that system. I had to throw it out. I shouldn't have been saying it to customers. Then I realized there's some pretty significant things that were out of order, and then there were some gaping holes of some things missing, generally around asking great questions and telling great stories. So I started to really fill it in, but here's what I realized. Once I had that assemblance of system, I focused on only changing one thing at a time. Because the problem is, and this is what salespeople will do, they'll read a book and they'll apply 17 of the different tactics into their next sale. They'll have this explosion and they won't know what caused it. So there were two powers with this. One was by treating it like a science experiment, I had to change one variable at a time. So I knew whether it improved my sales or, or made things worse. And over the course of an entire day of cold calling, you could pretty clearly see whether it was working or not. And then I'd either keep it or throw it out and then do the next thing that I learned for the next day. So for a lot of people, they're like, well, if I'm going to make a change, let's do it all at once. Let's rip off the band-aid. 
problem is you don't know what what's working and what's not so because of that i would say that the way i grew to succeed in sales was yes i'd go out change one thing go home and reflect on that and then change one more thing that was too slow compared to what i find most people they want they want things to happen quickly but they're still struggling years later, decades later, where six weeks of moving slowly, and even though I was like, I don't think this is working, saying going through the whole day to really test that out was important. But as an introvert, it gave me another real superpower. And I think this, if you wanna take the introversion out, I think it applies to both demographics, introversion and extroversion, especially if you're selling yourself, is that by focusing on this external system, it's not being personal. Like when somebody said no, I was like, oh, this thing's not working. Or, oh, if they said yes, it was this thing that was working. So it's not being, it, it stopped being such an emotional experience for me, which I actually found didn't tire me out as much, right? So I think that's really powerful for an introvert because mm -hmm. introverts have such analytical minds. If they can go, okay, let's let's work on this puzzle, let's experiment. Okay, we've proven that this isn't working. Let's do let's get a few more data points before we make that decision. All of a sudden, it stops being so exhausting. We start to have fun. Number of people that I've worked with inside my Rapid Growth Academy, and they said, Matt, I just want to sell a hundred percent, you know, online. I don't want to ever speak to a customer. And I'm like, well, firstly, it's not just me that's saying it. On my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, I interviewed Ryan Dice, like the guy that makes more money teaching people on the internet, how to make money on the internet, on the internet, right? And I said, can we really just do this? He's like, absolutely, eventually. But at the start, you have to have conversations with people, right? You Like even Ryan Dice, when he launched his um, his, his product, which was um, Digital Marketer HQ, he said, I'm gonna, he did it at his conference. He's like, I'm gonna be over there if you have any questions, ask me. He said, I had a hundred conversations in those three days. It was the worst three days of my life. He said, but at the end of those three days, I knew exactly what to say, what stories work, what stories didn't work, what questions to ask, what niches made more sense. He said, then we just wrote it into web copy and that was it. Funnily enough, when I teach people to just have those first phone calls, have those first sales meetings, all of a sudden they start to enjoy it. They realize, well, with a system, I can actually be in control. With this mindset of experimentation, it's not so mentally tolling. And I really can just have a conversation where I get to enjoy one person and right. not feel bad at the end, if they end up as a client because I bulldogged them into it, or I won't feel ripped off because I discounted them into buying, with a strong sales system, it should just be, and you know, follow the bouncing ball where you kind of enjoy each other's company. You just so happen to end up with a client at the end of it. I'm glad you brought that up too because um, one of the uh, one of the people who wrote a recommendation for your book is Jeffrey Gittimer, and and Jeffrey Gittimer is sort of I'm going to have him on my podcast in a couple of weeks. I love Jeffrey Gittimer. I grew up with him. Um, but he had this saying, like, you know, with the with the re the rapport, you know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care or something like that. I probably don't have it exactly right. And that's what that's what was kind of going through my ears while you were talking about that, because it, you, you can't have right. You, you have to have a personal relationship with your client. Now, you can conduct business any way you want, but if they don't know who you are and they don't know why you stand for what you stand for or whatever the case may be, you're going to have a tougher time keeping them engaged, right? I mean, people buy from people. Now, you know, you could say, well, no, people buy from Amazon. They only buy things from Amazon that they, that they know and can touch and feel. There's so many things that get sold that aren't like that, which is why you can't find them on Amazon, right? And that's not going to be, you can't, you're not going to buy that from a nameless, faceless person. You have to have, to have some type of rapport developed with people. Well, absolutely. I mean, if you look at Amazon, by the way, if your product's doing really, really well, next week you'll notice that Amazon Basic is out with the exact same yeah, product. Right. So if you don't want to be seen as as a commodity. And I mean, especially when you're talking service providers, it happens all the time. You know, I'm speaking at a for a society of accountants next week. Um, last week, I spoke at a, an event for insurance people. And you think they go into networking rooms and they say what they are and people go, oh, I need that. How much do you cost? Or, oh, I'm already working with somebody. No, thank you. They don't even know who you are. Right. So one of the things that I always talk about and look, don't get me wrong, sales systemization is massively important for every business and for, of course, for people in sales roles. But the thing that I talk about, and this is why I always come back to planning and strategy, right? Like in my mind, if you just start with sales, you've kind of already lost. You've got a lot of heavy lifting to do in your sales process where if you have separated yourself 
from the beginning, when if people don't see you as a commodity, then yes, they still want to know, like, and trust you. But if they feel your passion and mission for for serving a specific need or a specific group of people, and they don't see you as a commodity, but they see you as the only logical choice, then the no like and trust equation is actually mostly done for you. And then a lot of the heavy lifting around, you know, closing the deal is done because you don't have to negotiate so much on price. You get out of that hamster wheel of kind of struggling to find interest prospects, trying to set yourself apart and making the sale in an uncomfortable way. Let, let me ask you about the your, your uh, experience with introverts and extroverts when it comes to training. So when, when, and you kind of went through this a little bit, you know, like obviously most introverts aren't, they, they need a system because they're not comfortable just going out there and what I call uh, winging it, let's say, which is what I've found a lot of extroverts are, are think they're good at. Like, I'm just going to go out there. I'm just going to wing it, see where it goes. And, you know, I'll, I'll figure out where to reel it in. Right. And me being an introvert, I go with one of those people. And I go, you sound stupid. You don't sound prepared. I don't know why anybody would buy from you, but they do because different people resonate with different people. But as far as training people, like coachable people, do you find introverts to be, generally speaking, more coachable than extroverts and, and, and therefore way better equipped to be great salespeople for your business than the extrovert who comes in and with the big personality and, and you know, relies on that alone to make, to make sales? So I, I will give you, I'll give you the world's worst answer for an interview. The answer is yeah. yes and no. And Perfect. the reason for that is that there are, so introverts end up being the best learners because well, let's face it, especially with sales, we're kind of terrible at it if we don't have a system. But we first have to get them over their hurdle of you can do this, right? Because we've created this gift of gab wall. And if there are business owners out here that have got a sales team, the truth is if you've got an introvert and they're working on your team, you're accepting subpar performance because of their quiet nature. And that's on you because you haven't told them that they need to, that you, you haven't told them that they can sell as an introvert. You mm. haven't inspired them that success is possible for them. And that's what you need to do. So the truth is that I've worked with people that literally did not believe it was possible for them. Then they create excuses for why, you know, their story is different and why it's harder for them. Once they get beyond that and they go, you know what? No, I can do this or I need to do this is what happened with me and so many other people that I've worked with, they'll hold on to this system for dear life because without it, we're terrible at sales. So a lot of times, so why would you run the marathon if you don't think you can finish? You've got to get over that. But once you've realized you can finish and you can actually place in the top three, then of course you're going to run the marathon and then try and stop an introvert. What's interesting though is an extrovert tends to, yeah, they like to wing things. So when you say, hey, you should learn a sales system because the top 10% of all sales performers are, have a planned presentation, right? Jeffrey Gittemore and I, you know, I was on his podcast a while back and I think his interviews go for like 20 minutes. We were on there for an hour and he mm. was talking about, yeah, you know, I was a great winging it kind of salesperson, but when I started to teach others, when I started to really get good myself, was when I realized that it, I still had to systemize it. Now, here's the problem for an extrovert, they like winging things. I mean, it's kind of great to not have to do any preparation and close deals. So for them, they actually have to work harder and take a baby step back to then catapult forward. Right. So what actually happens, and I've worked with, you know, commercial real estate company recently, actually, and literally the two groups of people, the introvert in the team, I mean, this guy, like he made one appointment, which was borderline useless in like six months. Gosh, if he wasn't going to quit, he would have got fired. And he held on to this system. And six months later, he was actually, he won the, what are they called? The top dog award, which actually meant he was the first junior partner to beat everyone else in sales, including the principals of the organization who had never been outsold before ever. It took six months, but the bulldog salesperson, Alex uh, Durham, who was this kind of hardcore, get hyped up on coffee, extroverted salesperson, he actually did better straight away, but then migrated back to his winging it process because he loved it, right? And then at six months, when he was outselled by Thomas, he was like, well, hang on a second. Maybe I really need to look at this sales systemization stuff. Take it 12 months on, that $2 million company was a $10 million company because the whole organization created this sales culture that was really, I mean, a lot to be jealous of. So it, you know, we both have our burdens to bear. 
Now, if you look at, for instance, management, for instance, if you've got somebody teaching management, you might find that somebody gets up and they talk about planning for a meeting. And an extrovert will naturally say, oh yeah, but I like the more dynamic meetings because I tend to find stuff comes out better when it's fresh. Well, if you ask little Johnny or, or, or young Sarah, you know, what their, what their thoughts are, because they always have great ideas, they just never seem to bring them up in the meeting and they're introverted, they're going to go, well, I don't know, or their answer's not going to be great. They'll come back to you next week and say, I've had this thought. And you're going to be, why didn't you tell me in the meeting? Now I've, you know, I've implemented a suboptimum idea. And they're all about, how do I get my introverts to talk? And I'm like, well, actually, this is lazy leadership. Because if you had notified people that this was going to be the agenda of the meeting, and you were going to make special attention to asking Sarah and Johnny this specific question, they would have thought about it, you would have got the answer and that group dialogue in the meeting. So a lot of times, Introverts need to be inspired that they can, and not only can they sell, I mean, I, I mean, if you look at all forms of these so-called extrovert arenas, I can point to at least one introvert that is the best in the business. Then, on the extroverted side, they have to realize that their willingness to step back, or their unwillingness to step back, and do a little bit of the hard work is actually stopping them from flying forward. If you ask me which is the burden I'd prefer to bear, I'd prefer the burden of not believing it was possible because once I overcome that, everything is, you know, is, is there for me to get, where an extrovert has to constantly battle that they don't want to wing things. So while they have an advantage at the beginning, that's why I find most extroverts tend to lose out to their introverted count their introverted counterparts over time. That's a great point. I I uh, this whole system thing, like I started my first business when I was 26 and I had always been in operations, Matthew, and I had no idea how to sell anything. Or I was telling myself I had no idea how to sell anything. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have any practical experience, but I had to. So I, so I went at sort of like Alex as a story in your book. Um, and there's probably others of people who, and, and I, so when I met like Jeffrey Gittimer and stuff, I, I was, I was very open to, how can I out maneuver the extroverts who are maybe naturally better at this than I am, at least on the initial engagement thing until, the, you know, and what are all the things that they're not going to do that I am going to do in order to, you know, give me more in my mind, I thought I needed to level the playing field. I probably didn't, but that's what I was thinking. And, and I became very open to any kind of training I could get that would help me you know, system systematize my approach, but also add dynamics to my approach that the other people weren't doing so that, you know, I was different somehow. And maybe that would resonate with people um, because, and that was whether it was follow up or intro email or what, you know, whatever it was, I just, so anyway, I, I, I'm a believer. Well, I will tell you this, those advantages that a lot of extroverts perceived that they had in yeah. that world when they were in a meeting because they could turn that 30 minute meeting into a 45 minute or an hour meeting because they were in the room with that person, the energy was there. They've lost that in Zoom. People like structure these days. People like things to follow a uniformity uh, in the sales approach. And in truth, especially in the larger corporates now, where they're using AI to determine what are the best closing sentences, what are the best introductions, more and more it's becoming planned presentation over natural ability. Because the problem is natural ability you get that roller coaster ride that's largely based on a person's mood. An introvert, gosh, they could have just had you know, broken up with their their spouse the more, the day before, and they can still run the program. Of course, maybe it'll be slightly shakier, but it's not con directly connected to their mood. So because of that, they get a much more stable process. And mm -hmm. the other thing is that I will say that a lot of times we project that int uh, that extroverts are successful. Like when I wrote my my new book on networking, you know, I talk about three types of networkers, and I talk about the average networker is that kind of that transactional networker that a lot of people, even a lot of extroverts don't want to be. They walk around the network and do you want to buy from me? No, what about you? What about you? What about you? No one wants to be that person, but then often that then results in this other type of networking, which is, I call it aimless networking, where somebody asks you what you're doing, you're like, oh, my day job is, you don't do anything to sell it. Well, you all have a bunch of awkward conversations where eventually it comes up, what is it that you do? You have that awkward answer. You know, somebody asks you about how much do you cost? Or they say, oh, that's nice. And then you both excuse yourself to the bathroom. And 
that's why everybody walks off saying networking doesn't work. The truth is it does work. You're just doing it wrong. And you know, for me, I talk about strategic networking and knowing who's going to go before I even start going in there, can, you know, working out exactly what I'm going to say, what dialogues to have, because when you're an introvert, you want to go in with a plan. You want to make networking seem like a bunch of pre-planned meetings and you want to have a way of getting them to lean in so we don't feel like we're pushing things down people's throat. So what I would say is our natural disadvantages make us willing to plan, make us willing to prepare. And when it comes to things like networking, it allows us to run circles around extroverts. Now, again, not to say that extroverts can't do it. You'll find our mutual friend, Jeffrey Gittemore, actually will suggest a lot of the similar things that you should plan before you go. You should you know, practice what you're going to say, but that's because he's the, one of the best in the business and right. all the best in the business have a planned presentation. Yeah, know who you want to, to contact at the networking session, for example, and, and don't come up to them and tell them or ask them something that every single other person asks them. So I want to talk more about networking because, so here, here are, um, I consider networking to be a contact sport, meaning for me, um, it's like playing a very stressful and, and uh, um, demanding game. So I get into, um, you know, the environment and I'm immediately sort of overwhelmed. And by the end of it, if I make it through the whole thing, and I'm talking about various parts of my, uh, in my career, if I make it to the whole thing, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I just made it through 20 minutes of, of that, 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 um, you know, like you described for people like, like me, who's not a small talker, um, and not, you know, I'm not a person that can engage someone like, boom, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, yeah, but what if I'm, you know, got people coming at me that I don't know, or the person that engages you, and they're right away, they're looking past you, Matthew, have you ever had this? They're looking past you to the next person that they're going to then attack or, or whatever. Um, so I wanted to get, get some, would you mind giving me some, uh, you know, personal advice here? And I'm, and I'm going to start by giving you so just last week or the week before, this group, I'm in a group, uh, a Vistage group. Have you ever spoken to Vistage? I Vistage have, I've seen Vistage. I've, I've worked with groups similar to Vistage, but not okay. Vistage themselves. So I've been in this group for a long time, 14 years, and the people know me really well. And here's, we, we did this exercise. We had a retreat, and the exercise was that each, one, each person wrote on a sticky note what they admire about every other person, and then they put the different color sticky notes on your desk. And here's some of the things that that mindset, quiet, but authoritative, thinker, quiet, insightfulness, inquisitive, good listener, E.F. Hutton, which is a reference to an old reference, maybe even before your time, but like when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen. And then deep thinker, calculated. <laughs> so all of those things are, those, these people know me well, those are all, I think, almost all introvert, intro, uh, version type description. So here I am with that. That's my natural inclination. I get into a networking situation. Um, say there's 100 people there, little cocktail party. And I'm, I maybe know a few people there and the rest of the people I don't. What advice would you give me to maximize my contribution to the event and the value that, that I give and the value that I get out of the event? Absolutely. So first thing is, if you've gone into that room and you look around and you can only see a few people you know, you've already lost, right? So okay. what you need to do is, you need, okay, I'm going to this cocktail event. I'm going to this networking event. It's an event that I've never been before. Maybe there'll be somebody that I know, but if I know that person, <clears throat> then talking to them is the wrong idea because they're already part of my network. So how do I fix that situation? Well, the answer is every group these days, has, like whether it's a meetup.com where I can look at everybody's LinkedIn profile, like a shopping list of who I'd like to speak to, or a fa has a Facebook group where they've got a, pro a whole bunch of photos of people that were at the last event, I can then reach out to these people and say, hey, I was considering going to this event. I noticed that you were going. I'm really passionate about this specific thing, like helping introverts realize they're not second class citizens or helping small businesses succeed. You know, is, there, is this a good group for someone like me to come to? 
If they say yes, now firstly, I'm only reaching out to people that I actually want to speak to, right? Now, mm. firstly, I've got a 50-50 chance almost that those people are also going to be introverted. So when I walk into the room, now I don't have three faces that I maybe might know. I've got people that have not only said, yes, you should come, probably will see me and if they're extroverted, want to put me under their wing and introduce me. Or if they're introverted, go, oh my gosh, finally a face. I, don't, I can talk to that person. And it's someone new, so I'm networking, right? So a lot of times research not being done means you go to that networking room and you've already failed. Okay. Now, I'm sure you do this well because all reflective people do. When they go, they'll start asking questions of the other person. They'd be interested before they try to be interesting, which is really, really helpful. But when you get to that, oh my gosh, Mike, I've been talking for 20 minutes. I can't believe I haven't asked you what you do. My suggestion is usually what people do is they give a very, very functional answer. Let's just do it off the cuff if you're welcome to experiment because I know you said you wanted some advice for you specifically, yeah, and sure. I think this will really help the audience. Mike, if I was to ask you, oh my gosh, I'm, I can't believe I didn't ask you what you do. What is it that you do? We just met in a networking event. What would you say? Yeah, I would say that I, um, I have a podcast where I um, share success, stories of success that inspire and activate the greatness in you. Okay, so if I was to ask that, we would have a whole dialogue about your podcast then. Yeah. Does that in your mind ever lead to a conversation about working with them? Like if I said, yeah, but what do you, what do you actually do? What's, what's, your, what's, your, what's your day job? How do you earn your, your living? Yeah, so um, that would be different at various times, I guess. So, uh, um, so let's just, uh, let's just uh, assume that, that um, I just sold my second company. So let's just assume that I still had that, right? So I'd say, well, we help manufacturers solve complex waste problems. Perfect. Okay. So firstly, congratulations for selling your second business. That's amazing news. The, here's what I will say though. We help, you know, manufacturers solve complex problems, right? So what I'm hearing there is this functional skill of what you do. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've got a manufacturing company. Do you, do you consult? How much do you charge? Now we're talking about price. If I'm not in manufacturing, I go, oh, that's nice. And then we have that awkward pause that we were talking about, right? Yeah, sure. So, Here's what I will respond with that's, that's different. Now, firstly, I will introduce what's called a unified message, which we'll talk about in a second. It's, it's something that doesn't commoditize me at all, right? Um, but what, when somebody asks me what exactly is that, so the whole idea is that they get back to asking what is that rather than assuming that they know, right? Because what I got from that is that you're a consultant, right? So I then go, oh, consulting, manufacturing, okay, how much do you charge? Now, that's what happens, or I'll say, oh, I've already worked with someone like that, or I'm you know, not in that industry. What I will respond with is one of the things that I love to see is an amazing introverted entrepreneur that has enough belief and talent to go out and start a business for themselves. However, I find more often than not, you know, what I hate seeing is that they often end up in a constant hamster wheel of struggling to find interested people, trying to set themselves apart and making a sale. As a matter of fact, they're almost convinced that people only care about one thing, price. Do you know anyone like that? Now, if I've gone to the right networking event, of course there's someone like that. Yeah. And they're like, well, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm like that. I mean, I, I, a lot of times people only care about price. And I said, well, I'm on a mission to help these introverted service providers, you know, realize that they really can obtain a rapid growth business doing what they love, but it's not going to be about getting better at their functional skill. They're usually amazing at that. It's usually about focusing on the three things outside the scope of their functional skill that they can utilize really to have a rapid growth business that they do love. Actually, you know what? Let me give you an example and then I'll move into a story of Wendy, which is you know the story that I might use to explain the, uh, the unified message at the beginning. So all of that comes from, notice that I didn't talk about my functional skill. Like if I said I was a sales coach or a marketing coach, if I said, oh, you know, one of the things that I'm just really motivated to do is help introverts learn sales and marketing strategies to succeed in business. Oh, I need that. How much do you cost? Or we have this whole conversation about whether introverts can or can't. Instead, I've communicated what I love to see and what I hate to see. I've talked about my mission. My passion and mission is everything that comes out. And then I segue into a story. Now, that's a little bit long to give away if somebody's like, oh, what is it you do? And you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just getting hammered with passion, mission, and story way too much. If somebody hasn't asked, now no one's gonna ask if I say, oh, I'm a sales and marketing coach. They're not gonna go, oh, what exactly is that? They already know. So how do I bring in this conversation? Well, the answer is I lead with what's called a unified message. And a unified message is something that is designed to not commoditize myself. 
For instance, I call myself the rapid growth guy. And I'll, I'll give you a different example. I worked with a language coach out of California and she taught kids and adults Mandarin. And for the longest time, she'd been charging about 50 to $80 an hour for private consultation. The problem that she had was that now there are all these people moving into California that were willing to charge 30 or $40 an hour for private consultation just to start their new businesses. There were people on Craigslist from China, thanks to this global economy we live in, charging $12 an hour. And there are all these people now with software, thanks to our friends in Silicon Valley, you know, I'll teach you English, you teach me Mandarin, we just won't charge anyone anything. So now she's competing against free. So she's like, Matt, what sales techniques can I use? What networking techniques can I use to get people talking to me and then close the deals? I'm like that's not going to work, right? If they see you as a commodity, then you're always going to feel like you're convincing and cajoling, and eventually there's always going to be a price question. We need to sidestep the battle altogether. So what I did is I looked at all the clients that she'd worked with over the years, and what I realized of the hundreds of people she worked with, she worked with two executives where she helped them with much more. The first thing was this concept of, well, they just have a different way of doing rapport in China than the Western world. Like, Mike, if I was in the, in, 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 you know, if, if I was trying to sell you something in the U.S., or, or in Australia, like I, if I was a bad salesperson at the end of 45 minutes, I might say something horrible like, so do you want to move forward? And you would say, yeah, um, yes, no, or everyone's favorite. Let me think about it, right? Yeah, let me think about it. I'll get back to you. Send, Send me some, some information. Though. Exactly. Now, yeah. if I said, if I reached out a week from now and you still said you wanted to think about it, I know my chances of getting that seller just, they're, going, they're bottoming out. Yet in China, they're going to want to see me maybe five, six times before they discuss business. They're probably going to want to see me drunk over karaoke once or twice. And the reason for is they want to know the character of the person that they're talking to, because they're not talking about transactional 12 month, 24 month deals. A lot of times they're talking 25, 50 year deals. They want to know the character of the person they're doing business with. And she helped them understand that. She also helped them understand the difference between e-commerce in China and the Western world and the importance of respect, like learning the language isn't enough. You've got to reduce your accent, how to handle a business card and why it matters. Now for everyone else, not so essential for these two executives being relocated to China, so important. And I said, Wendy, for these people, you're doing so much more than just language tuition. What are you doing? So, well, there's just a few things I'm just trying to help. And I said, yes, but you're stuck in your functional skill. By the way, everybody, I've never met anybody that doesn't do a ton more stuff than what they say in a networking and sales event about how they help their customer. I said, Wendy, you're stuck in your functional skill. Is it fair to assume as a result of the assistance that you're giving these people, they're going to be more successful when they get to China? And she's like, yeah, I mean, that's the point, right? I said, great, then let's call you the China success coach. Forget about Mandarin consultancy for a second. Let's focus on these executives and let's create a five week intensive, which we call the China success intensive, which worked with the executive, the spouse and any children being relocated to China. She loved the idea of this. She's like, but who do I sell to? Now, this is important because where do you go networking? I said, well, who do you think your ideal client is? And she's like, well, obviously it's the executive. Like, yeah, you'd think so, right? I mean, I was terrified moving from Australia to the US, but I mean, here they speak the same language. I said, I just don't think it's your ideal client. She said, well, obviously the organizations would pay. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. They've got millions of dollars often riding on an executive being successful. I still don't think so though. Frustrated, she's like, well, who then? I said, I think your ideal client is the immigration attorney. She's like, what? I said, think about the way they make money. They may make five to $7,000 for doing all the paperwork, all the bureaucracy, you know, got, they've got to get a customer that you know that's not cheap they've got to pay rent and staff they'd be lucky to make three thousand dollars i said just offer them three thousand dollars for a successful introduction they love mm. the idea they're like double my profit for a simple introduction what have i got to say she said all you've got to do is say congratulations you've now got your visa i just want to double check you're as ready as possible to be relocated to china and they'd be like yeah you know i think we're set overconfident executive we've got our visas now thank you we've got our place sorted we're learning the language kids are getting pretty good at it too i think we're good to go and they would just respond with, there's a lot more to it than that. I think you need to speak to the China success coach. So let's think about this in from a form of networking. Now, instead of going to networking events where executives are trying to talk about language um, consultation and they're like, oh, I'm already working with someone or I need that. How much do you cost that person? 30 or $40 an hour. She then says, oh, I'm the China success coach and stops talking. People are like, what? What exactly is that? Of course, she's only at networking events. Where, where, where immigration attorneys are, right? Then when they ask, she then talks about her passion and mission for helping these executives and how she's on a mission. Now, they're not her ideal clients, but they know a whole bunch of people that are, so they get talking and then she tells a story about how she works with immigration attorneys that gets them a great paycheck, but also allows them to serve their clients more to ensure they truly get to success. 
Think about how that worked by doing our research, knowing what event to go to, connecting with people beforehand that happen to be immigration attorneys. So they're expecting us then talking about, you know, asking them about them being interested and then just waiting for our opportunity and just leading in with, I'm the China success coach. And then just waiting for them to have a minor brain malfunction because they don't know what that is to asking a question and getting talking about your passion, mission, and a story. That is transformatively different than what most people do. Like when I go to a networking event and they ask me what I do, if I say I'm a sales trainer or, or a, a business coach or I'm a marketing specialist, people don't give me the time of day to even explain what my passion is. But when I say I'm the rapid growth guy, they lean in, like, oh my gosh, I've never heard of that before. What exactly is that? And I go straight to passion, mission, and story. You own that dialogue, you own that conversation. They feel how much you love doing what you do. And at that point, you can take them anywhere you want to go. Matthew, that was one of the most amazing conversations or explanations of how to be a good how to be how to be a good networker that I've ever heard. I mean, you you broke down you know how to do it, how to how to get out of the you know being stuck and functional. I, when, and whenever I hear that, I hear commoditization, right? So as soon as you use a word that I recognize, I define you instead of you being able to define me. And then actually thinking through it, you know, to where her ideal lead source is, which is what you found for her, right? Not her ideal client, but her ideal lead source. And then the whole thing around that, that was, that was a really great, great way to describe that. Thank you for doing that. Look, it's my yeah. pleasure. I think that the important thing for people to understand, because everyone's like, what's the tactic? What's the silver bullet? The truth is this isn't a tactic. This is a step-by-step -step strategy. You know, one of the things I always tell people about rapid growth is rapid growth is a step-by-step -step process where each part leads to the next that ends up with a rapid growth business. So if you just learn how to sell really well, but they're seeing you as a commodity, then it's always gonna be slightly harder. If you're going to the wrong networking events because you haven't really understood where your niche is or where your, person, your, your joint venture partners could possibly be and how they make their money, you could be going to the wrong events, you could be working too hard. Now, I will tell you that what we created for Wendy was what we called the China Success Intensive, which was a short-term Trojan horse package. I've developed those for people in the copywriting space that struggle to get $2,500 subscriptions on a monthly basis we've introduced a three and a half thousand small term consulting gig that leads to $10,000 a month monthly subscriptions and their businesses have exploded. Mm. When you think about rapid growth, there's no one tactic. And this is where things can get tough for a small business owner because they're like, well, what's the one thing that I can do right now? And the answer is you have to stand still, not for months, not for weeks, but for days and focus on the entire strategy to be successful. And what you really want to start with is how do I create my version of the China success coach, the rapid growth guy? And then how do I then have a dialogue about my passion and mission? Because so often we go to networking events and especially introverts. I mean, we don't want to sound like this, but we come across like sounding, you know, Mike, I'd really love to have you as a new client because I'm just dying to buy a new car as opposed to, you know, I'm just put on this earth to truly help this demographic. And I find that I just hate seeing them in this situation. And that's why I'm on this mission. And all of a sudden they're, oh my gosh, this person and cares about me and they don't care you know if you lead straight into a story then because stories by the way if you lead with jargon and you go into consultation mode which is what we all do right we start teaching we start helping and then we wonder why they don't work with us they're like oh you know mike let me just go and utilize some of that information i'll come back and i'll call you sure they will where what i'll do is i'll go into a story and stories short circuit the logical mind you speak directly to the emotional mind the part of the mind that buys by the way for introverts specifically as well, it activates the reticular activating system of our brain, which creates artificial rapport that we can leverage into real rapport. You know, introverts struggle with initial rapport, but we're great at fostering deep relationships. So it's a great shortcut. It's why when I go on stage, I start with a story and people remember up to 22 times more information when embedded into a story. So when I, when I tell stories, sometimes I'll tell a two, three, four minute story. I mean, think about this podcast. I just told the whole Wendy story but I seeded all the information inside it, which means everyone will remember it by just me saying, do you remember the story of Wendy? Just like if I was to mention three of that objects like chairs, porridge or beds, they may not mean anything to anyone. People may not remember them a year from now, but if I said Goldilocks and the three bears, instant recall, everyone would Never know yeah. those three elements. Yeah. Well, Matthew, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Thank you so much for coming on and, and, and um, inspiring all of us introverts, uh, especially um, how to be more successful, how to use your introversion uh, as a, um, uh, an advantage.
right? Use your introversion as an advantage, not as not as something that you feel like you have to apologize for or or, um, or fight against, right? It is what it is. So you have it, so let's use it. Like your vision, right? This is a, just part of who I am. So what do I need to do? What kind of glasses do I need to put on in order to be as successful as I can? I, I, I This has been really fun. I do appreciate it. And I connected with you on LinkedIn. I know that's a good place to, to find you. Where else do you want people to connect with you and what, what do you want them to do? Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think the analogy that came to mind when you were saying that is it's terrifying when you're skidding into a curve to steer into the curve or into the skid to steer out. But the only way we can take control is to lean in to what we see as our disadvantage. And then you'll realize it's actually a superpower. Um, but yeah, you can reach out in a bunch of different ways. So obviously I've got a podcast called The Introvert's Edge, which you should definitely check out. I interview what I call a bunch of introverted titans, people that we wouldn't think are introverted that are the leaders in their field. Um, you know, the, we even interview, you know, well, there's a whole bunch of interviews there. Yes, you can find me on LinkedIn, on Instagram, Facebook. I put a ton of videos out, YouTube, I do the same. But for a lot of people, their, their major questions are going to be, okay, how do I create this unified message and niche? You don't have to hire me for that. I mean, you can go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth, and there you'll be able to download a five-step template that'll really help you create your unified message and discover your niche of willing to buy clients. You know, I did this at a, an event with nearly 200 people in the room, and I said at the end of the session, you know, if you now believe you've got a great message and you've identified your niche, people will pay you what you're worth, put your hand up. Like 97% of the room put their hands up, which sounds mm. great until I said, you know, keep your hands up though, if this is the longest time you've ever spent actively working on your marketing, the whole session was 90 minutes long. Like 85% of the room kept their hands up. So the key is this template, which you can get at matthewpollard.com forward slash growth, uh, will help you do that. But you wanna allocate about two hours to do it with somebody else that's not from your functional skill, so you don't get into that group thing. And then I'd also recommend you check out theintrovertsedge.com and theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. The publisher hates me when I say this, but you don't need to buy my books. There you'll find the first chapters of both. In the sales book, you know, I'll map out the full seven steps. Firstly, I'll get you over the fact that you believe you can sell and help you realize that you can be an amazing salesperson and not feel salesy either. And then I'll show you the exact steps. So you can literally grab what you currently say and put it in. And like I did, you'll realize some things don't fit, some things are out of order, there's some gaping holes. And that'll double your sales in the next 60 days. And then you can do the same with networking at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking, get the first chapter and then get to work on your, your networking game. Perfect. Well, there's a lot of resources there, so grab it. You know, you've heard a little bit, a very, very small slice of Matthew today, um, but I think it's been super powerful. So if you want to learn more and you're willing to do the work, because there's no microwave to success, you have to do the work, uh, go check him out and learn more about him. So Matthew, thanks so much for being on the show. It was my absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this episode of the How Did Happen podcast, where we believe that success doesn't happen unless you make it happen. You can subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. And while you're there, please rate it and leave a comment as well. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the show, ideas for future guests, or whatever you'd like to share. And of course, you can always find me at MikeMalatesta.com. See you next time. Thanks again for listening to the How Did Happen podcast.